guys, and welcome back to Closet Cosplay, the podcast where we create con-worthy cosplays on a closet budget. I'm Michelle. And I'm LJ. And today we're going to talk about heroes and villains. And what we mean is we are going to talk about some of the similarities we see between heroes and villains and then some of the things that definitely make them different. We're going to talk about color schemes. We're going to talk about maybe the different angles, the different poses you see heroes and villains do and the things that make them different as well. Yeah, it's actually really interesting because uh, across many different genres and cultures, you'll see a number of characteristics that pop up between what a culture or a story constitutes as a villain and what constitutes as a hero. And often they're similar colors, they're similar stances, they're similar uh, even angles versus curves. And it's really interesting because those things will read in a, a lot of different mediums. I always thought, um, and even I just thought of this just now, I think it's interesting when you see a hero and a villain in, in a particular story and kind of how they will complement each other almost in a way that's interesting and exciting. Yeah, complement with, what is it, with an E versus an I. <laughs> it's meant to be sort of like right. contrasting because uh, it's always supposed yes. to be different. And it's not necessarily going to be the same sort of contrast um, in in a story when you compare it to another story like one of my favorite contrasts and people talk about this a lot especially when it comes to disney is um often they like to cast their villains in they're going to be either old or what would be considered overweight so somebody like Yzma from Emperor's New Groove is very old and thin and skeletal-like, whereas you have somebody frail. Who, right, like frail, or you have somebody like Ursula, who is, you know, rounder and older, and, you know, she talks about body language. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's very, like, obvious what they're trying to say with that, whereas, like, younger, you know, the heroes are always cast in, like, young and beautiful or flawless and stuff like that. Or, or innocent, naive, yeah. or, you know, adventurous and curious, and, and the villains are these experience driven they have all this um, knowledge under their belts or they they've lived a long time they know so much more type attitudes yeah which is kind of weird if you think about it, you'd be like oh the more knowledgeable people uh, shouldn't necessarily be the bad guys but sometimes that's the way it ends up um my cat's trying yeah. to touch me in the face right now sorry <laughs> she, she when she when i start talking uh she decides that that's the time that my hands are free because i talk with my hands so that must mean that i can pet her uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing right now oh uh, i love um i just i just saw um captain hook i love the difference between captain hook and peter pan because if yes. you look at Peter Pan's costuming, it's super simplistic, minimalistic in that it's simple green, one color. It's very like light and there's not a lot of, you know, extra frills or anything to it. And then you look at Captain Hook's costume and it's like frills and ruffles and a huge hat and a big feather and all the extras, you know, and the hook, the shiny hook and all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's interesting because when you, when you look at a lot of depictions of who is the villain, who is the bad guy, uh, the theme of rich and accoutrement and royalty will pop up over and over and over again. You will see oh, you know, is it wealth. Ratcliffe in Pocahontas. Yep. How he always had this air of just almost this royal, like, I am it. <laughs> and, and you had you know the evil queen and snow white you have the uh just basically like you can point to any disney movie for the most part and a bad guy is going to be some sort of embodiment of wealth or royalty or privilege and it's it's almost always 
the underdog or the displaced royal that becomes the hero, like somebody that's of the people. And you'll see that depicted a lot in their colors. They're usually like Mm -hmm. pale, soft colors or earthly colors. And with the royalty, it's, you know, everybody associates purple with royal for you know a good reason that's got a lot of historical context so when you look at characters that have purple like ursula had purple uh the maleficent. maleficent had purple because these are jafar had purple i love jafar and they all have angles <laughs> if you notice that they all have those very sharp angles like angular um, faces angular details it's very interesting how you see these sort of like yeah like that similar look almost across everything and so mm-hmm. if, if you're looking to cosplay uh, a villain most of the time you're going to be looking for these blacks, these purples, these angular looks to try to give yourself a sharp, regal kind of accentuation. Um, anime can be a little bit different. Uh, usually, like, you know, sometimes you'll have the the random bad guy that looks like a innocent little girl. But in the Western <laughs> sort of cartoons and things like that, they kind of fit a pattern and it's the angular the purples the blacks the reds burgundies what's that the burgundies and then you've got the sharp contrast of gold crowns and a lot of them if if they have the royalty and the jewels and all of that uh prince john with his rings um, another yeah. one I, thought of, I, I mean Cinderella is not technically a hero I wouldn't guess but the contrast between Cinderella and the stepmother and the stepsisters like the dynamic there I think oh, really yeah. fits that rich versus poor you know these well what's so interesting is uh, one of the things that you see a lot uh, if you notice in some of these older Disney and stories like especially Cinderella is you see the color uh, of light blue attributed to women and one of the reasons that you see that a lot is blue is associated with the Virgin Mary and Christianity and so it was this very peaceful serene coloring that was usually attributed to women it was supposed to give them this sort of you know serene motherly kind of like gentle aptitude and likewise red and even pink up until the 1920s was associated with men because it was a a bloody color it was a vibrant color it was a it was the color of war and blood and so like you that's why one of the reasons you see you know some somebody like captain hook have this bright bloody red coat is because that was a manly color and somebody like Cinderella who had a beautiful serene blue dress as that was kind of the signal coloring of the time and you'll see that reverberated a lot even today it's so interesting to think about colors in the you know past in the generations and what what it meant then versus what it means now yeah it, it's it's really interesting especially because uh, just a slight offshoot of what I was talking about is uh, the color of pink and blue has completely switched. You know, we associate blue with boys and pink with girls, but even as early as the 1920s, it was the opposite because of just just what I said. But that's one of the reasons that in some of those older Disney films, you'll see pinks and reds associated with men and villains, even to a certain extent, and blues and light colors to say with heroines because it was the gentle color. It was the serene color. And you'll still see that today in a certain extent. Of course, now pink obviously takes over girls uh, these days and blues as boys. But um, that's one of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at stuff from a different era. Whatever the context was at the time may not mean what it is now, but it is important to understand what they were trying to get across at the time. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I've always loved, you know, the meaning behind like royalty and purple and like the jewel tones being related to, you know, that high status, that reigning family type yeah. stuff and, and how we just kind of color related a lot. So much. do what yeah and like we were 
Oh, I was just saying, and like we were discussing a little bit earlier, is like the purple was from a very, uh, I don't know if the snail was rare or if it was just hard to obtain, but it was the color purple during Roman times was derived from a particular snail that had to be crushed. And it was either difficult or rare, but that's why you see purple uh, associated with royalty. And you know, nowadays any color is obtainable whatsoever, but these things are holdovers. Um, and you do see those in in various cartoons and things like that. And even today, I know several people that they associate being rich or being affluent with the color purple. It lasts a long time. Right. It's really interesting to me um, to think about the relations colors have with, you know, the perception you might have of a person's status or whatnot. And, and I think you mentioned this earlier when we were talking, but just saying like purple is representative, you know, because it's related to royalty, it's related to power and power in a villain makes sense. So it makes sense that villains would be in those purple tones. And they are a lot. And a lot of older stories have to do with the common folk or the underdog rising up against an established power. So you'll see those characters, the opposition characters, represented with colors and positions that represent what they're fighting against. It's a purple it's a position it's any number of those things and when you're trying to cosplay those particular characters and i always come back i always come back to accuracy versus readability and when it comes to villains i love villains villains are one of my favorite things to cosplay so like i i'm always about them and i will say definitely the things that are going to cut get across to you even if they don't know who you are certain things are going to come across the color purple the color black the color red an angular eye line a sharp hairline like all of those things are going to read and they may not know who you are but they know what you represent and that's almost just as important right now we talked a lot about villains, right? With these purples and these these deep dark colors and the angles. So, what would be the almost opposite in a hero that you see? I know you talked a little bit about light blues, but what other things? What features uh, of heroes the- are important? So, where you think about villains as? angular in the sense of being older um when you think of heroes are often youthful so they're the round full cheeks or they're a beautiful young girl that you know is just on the cusp of womanhood so they're usually curvaceous you know what disney princess can you think of that wasn't beautiful right like they're always yeah. yeah like they're always beautiful Finally, Princess Anna woke up and looked a little bit of a mess one morning. <laughs> and I said, thank you. Finally. <laughs> Finally, a realistic princess. And it's so, and it's just as an off tangent. I was just recently, I saw some graph that was listing like the hero of a story and then like their love interest and the age gap between them. <gasps> oh my gosh. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Like, you don't realize it, but there are several characters that are, like, 14. And then there's, like, their love interest in their, in their 20s. And you're like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like, that's not okay. <laughs> right. But, Crazy how young some of these Disney princesses were. Yeah, it really is. But that that is one of the things that come across is youthfulness. We associate right. good with youthfulness and bad with age. And it's it's weird when we think about it today, because you're like, why are those two things inherently, Mm. you know, diametrically opposed? And you wonder if it doesn't come somewhat in hand with the idea that as you were older, you have the power. So it goes back to this idea that that power and age and corruption are all sort of bundled together and that 
heroism is in the youth and is in the young and is in the <laughs> the, the plump and the youthful and things like right. that. And that's, that's what you see across almost every cultural story. And it's kind of messed up. And I really, honestly, in my opinion, I would love to see a story where the bad guy is a young person and the good guy is an old person. Um, yeah. I'm I would to, love I to was see really that. I trying to like, brainstorm. I said, okay, what? there's got to be an old hero I can think of, right? Like, right? got to be. And I'm sitting here an and I'm, I'm trying person. to think of something. And there's really not much not that comes immediately to mind like no, you could, not immediately i i don't know much about star wars like arguably you could say some of the like older star wars characters but like that even then awesome. most of the main characters in star wars are young so that's not even a good argument right but, like i would love to see that trope turned on its head just for something right. different because it feels like right. it's so overplayed Right. Oh, yeah. And it's I, certain, yeah. And also another thing Disney plays a lot into that, like, I've noticed recently, a lot of parents, like, they don't have both parents in the picture ever, it seems like. Yeah. Like so, one parent out of the picture. That's another trope they play into a lot, it seems. Yeah, it's like you have to lose a parent to have any sort of character. <laughs> it's right. Really right. Weird. And I actually, I, I read something interesting uh, a while back on one of the reasons you started to see that st- not only pop up in a lot of Disney movies, but in a lot of TV shows. Um, back in the late 80s and early 90s, you would see a lot of TV shows where uh, one of the parents was dead. Typically, the mother was dead. And right. Uh, one of the theories about why you saw so much of that at the time was because that was when you started to see a rise in divorce. So it was a way to relate to normalize it almost. You to, think? To, not even necessarily normalize it, but like represent it in a way that wasn't straight up talking about it. Like yeah. the family still can go on even without one of the parents because divorce was still kind of while it was happening more at the time, it was still taboo in its own way. So you couldn't really talk about it directly, but it was easy to talk about it if it was just like, oh, well, one of the parents died. Well, now you have to deal with one of the parents being absent. So right. one right. of the theories That's about yeah, Disney movies was that was also kind of the idea is you were having all of these children that didn't necessarily have both of their parents at the time, but you didn't want to devalue them. You didn't want to you know, make them feel like less. You wanted to right. say, hey, you still have it in you to be right. somebody. Right. And I think that's a good that's message. A message. Yeah, absolutely it is. Because, yeah. like, I, you know, am one of the many children that grew up in a divorced household. And I didn't necessarily make that connection. But, like, <laughs> I appreciate it. And I, I hope some people got you know, that message that just because your parents didn't stay together, it doesn't make you any less of a person. Oh, Maybe yeah. you have an evil queen as a stepmother, like a Snow White, but it doesn't right. make you any right. less of a hero. You still deserve a prince, girl. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Even though she was like 16. <laughs> like, uh, sure. Let's not think about it. Let's not think about it too hard. Hey, I, I, I was I, the earliest cosplay technically cosplay photo of me that exists is when i was four years old dressed up as snow white (laughs) (laughs) oh man i will have to find that at some point but it's so funny because the black wig that my mother found for me like she couldn't find like a normal black like snow white wig so I had this like afro wig. <laughs> so I have this giant black afro as like a four year old Snow White. And it's how cute. It's the best. <laughs> I love that. I yeah. love that. Okay. So I wanna okay, I wanna highlight something that kind of brought us to this theme today. Oh. So, um, I recently acquired a copy of the board game. I guess you'd consider it a board slash card game, but it's called Villainous, and it is, it's got Disney on the cover, so Disney endorses it, and 
It is about yeah. Disney villains and they each have powers and they kind of have their own goals they're going for and you play against other players. And the base game has the following villains included. Captain Hook, Maleficent, Jafar, Ursula, Prince John, and the Queen of Hearts. So all six of these characters kind of battle it out for their own goals and their own aims. And I just think it's such a cool concept to be playing the villain, you know, because everybody wants to play the hero. So this game gives you a chance to play the villain and achieve the villain's goals, you know, for once they get to win. <laughs> And I, to shine. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was super cool. And I am going to make sure that we provide you guys a link if you are interested in seeing this game. But I just loved the colors of it. It The box is green and black and has Maleficent on the front, you know, in the super powerful stance holding her staff up. And it's just got great aesthetics to it. I love the looks of it. I mean, purples, blacks, and dark greens are all over the box so it's right right alongside all the colors we were talking about we actually didn't even, didn't even really discuss green but green green is a oh, uh, very important color green in... yeah i think uh maleficent is green so true so interesting she's awesome i love maleficent i mean she's a dragon it's so she's cool so cool she's so cool i love it yeah, that dragon form scene like terrified me as a child, straight up. Oh, really? Yes, it's <laughs> oh, so I loved her. I thought she was so cool. I always remember that scene where she like walks yes. into the thing and she's like, "I wasn't invited," and it's just like so, <laughs> so good. It's like a power move. It's just like you didn't even invite me. Like her, whoever was her animator, I just loved like her and because usually they assign like certain people. To right. oversee certain animators and like her animator and the animator for uh, Claude Frollo in Hunchback of um, Notre Dame. Uh, oh my God. So I good. We watched the Hunchback of Notre Dame recently ish, like within the last three years. And he was nuts obsessed. Yeah. I did not like that gypsy girl. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Wild. I did not notice that when I was a child. It is crazy to go back and watch some of these like movies you loved as a child as an adult and be like, what is some going of them on? Have some very adult themes. And yeah. Hunchback of Notre Dame is one of my favorite Disney movies. The soundtrack itself is just absolutely amazing. Like the animation for Claude Frollo himself is so good. Like I could go on and on about Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's one of my I mean, favorite Disney movies. But yeah. Oh, I digress. I, I, have a great <laughs> place. I love that movie. Yes. My favorite, favorite, favorite Disney movie, though, is Hercules. Is it really? I love Hercules. Yes. It's so good. It's my favorite. I, I love watched that it. So I love I wanted to be Meg so bad. I was she like, was I am so not awesome. a damsel in distress. <laughs> I will take care of myself. Love that. Yeah, Meg was amazing. Uh, one of the, the my, when I was little, my favorite was Little Mermaid. As I oh, yeah. got, yeah, as I got a little older, my next favorite became. I wanted to be very specifically Jasmine in the red outfit from oh. Aladdin. Yep, <laughs> like, yep. I was just like, that is that is a power move right there. She's like. Oh. Like gonna be all sultry and cool, and like use her like sexuality to like get one over on him. Like I just thought that was like, wait, what? Like yeah. that was such a crazy <laughs> idea. And it's so funny that goes back to the the whole like she was kind of given a villainous role in that sense. And what color did oh, they put her in? They put her in red. That's like interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you, you still see that kind of like association with those certain colors with certain things. Oh, did you see the um, article somewhere where somebody pointed out Ariel and all of her sisters had a color that like represented the seed that they were named after or something crazy like that? Yeah. I didn't see that. that color, like correlated to something like that. It was really interesting. That sounds I interesting. I haven't I seen that. It. I'd have to refine the art. I'm like really up on my obscure <laughs> Disney lore. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was an interesting article and I don't like remember much about it, but it was just something about like each sister's color related to a C. That makes sense. Cause like, was it, wasn't it seven sisters and there's seven I C's? Think so. I think so. Something like that. You know, it's King Triton. That's so funny. Yeah. Interesting. It was, it was an interesting article. Maybe I'll find it in the coming yeah, days. Yeah, we'll, 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 share it with you. we can find it. We can post yeah. it because um, I love stuff like that. What What else? What else can we talk about? Have we covered oh everything that we want to? Oh wait, I want to talk about um, posing. Yes, yes, I love I love posing because there's very specific body language. Body language. Body language. <laughs> Speaking of, it's Ursula says, and it's so funny because, like, and this has to go back. A lot of things with Disney, you have to remember, are a little bit antiquated, and so anything that's like sultry and like almost sexual in a way is usually associated with a villain more mm-hmm. so than it is associated with a heroine because a heroine would never be like that. Yeah, a heroine is innocent. She, right. you know, she's virginal. She is, she's light blue. She's the Virgin Mary. Like it's those, those same sort of like telling things that kind of come across. Right. Um, it's like yeah. the curiosity looks and the, you know, these young kind of, I'm curious and, and open to adventure type ideals. Yeah. And again, it goes back to the youth versus age. And so you'll have a lot of the wide eyed, like open sort of, this has to mostly do with the, you know, when people ask you for pictures and things like if you're playing a heroine, you don't necessarily want to have this very closed off or even you know sultry look to you know it feels really weird for me to say that but it's yeah honestly the truth like when you think of cinderella you don't think of somebody giving you bedroom eyes you think of somebody who's like you know very like demure and 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 reserved and things like that yeah and while we have come forward and our ideas I like to think in what constitutes a hero or a villain or et cetera. When you're playing a certain character, you, you do kind of have to keep in mind the time that that character was created, the way that, that character comes across and what that character is trying to represent. And so while some of it may feel a little dated in 2020, <laughs> you have to remember some of these characters proceed even the creations that we know them as some of those stories exist hundreds of years before what we know them as and they do fall into certain stereotypes or genres of representations and if you're not comfortable playing that character then that's fine but don't be surprised if somebody's like Wow, why is Cinderella trying to show me some bare shoulder? Like <laughs> side eye, you know, that side yeah. eye that the villains do. They always look at you sideways. Oh, yeah. You know, it's the, the, and see you are kind of look. Yeah, and I love villains for that. See, me personally, I'm a villain cosplayer more than I am a hero cosplayer. I love playing the the side eye. I love playing the sultry. I love playing the kind of like I have a secret. And that's how I always kind of play villains. I have a secret. Right. And you can't know it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's always so much fun. And like heroes are very open books. And they have more open stances. I think of, you know, all of the character actors at Disney World. You know, you see all the princesses and all the, you know, innocent characters, hero characters be so like open and inviting and friendly and they're always the ones like opening up for a hug and stuff and then you'll see the the you know oh bad characters hero characters you know closed off or smirking or they've got some kind of face you know and it, yeah. it's definitely the the stark differences between the way they pose and the way they interact and i think if you're trying to get like characterization i think that'd be a fun place to start it's just you know look up those characters because yeah. they do a ton of study behind like they watch the movie a ton of times. They know exactly what that character would do or how they would move or, you know, how That's they would interact really good with people. Idea. And I always found those videos so interesting with just the way they would approach people or the way they would act towards somebody. 
I didn't even think of that. That That's a really, really good idea. And it's a really good idea, not only just on its surface, but like most people will be like, oh, I'm just going to watch the videos. Well, you can actually go and watch a real person interact with other real people right. in real time right. as that character. And yeah. that's such a great idea. And because that's part of it for cosplaying is people sometimes cosplay two different ways is they're just going to be the, themselves in the costume. And then some people actually want to cosplay that character. And yeah. that's really, really cool. And I haven't really gotten ever a chance to necessarily do that outside of LARP, which is a whole different animal. Right. But that would be super cool to be able to be like, I'm Maleficent. Like that would be so cool. Yes. <laughs> I love that idea. Like I I, I've, I've seen a couple sometimes. of those videos. Yeah. I've seen like yeah. the, the guy who plays Gaston, like challenge people yes. to push ups. <laughs> yes. And it's awesome. I love that. It's so right. good. You just think like, oh, what would that so character awesome. do? And then you just be that. And I think that'd be so fun. Cause normally when I cosplay, I'm just, I'm this look, you know, and I'm just like myself and I just love to, you know, look the way I want to look. But I think the characterization adds a whole new level to it. It really does. And it's very, very cool. And honestly, there's a lot of people who, who want that out of cosplay that go to see cosplayers in person yeah. is, is they kind of want a realistic or at least in-person representation of a character that they really care about. And while that's never been like a super big thing for me, I have seen the few co the, the few cons that I've actually attended where somebody's been really excited that I'm a certain character and mm -hmm. like I'll try to play that up and it makes her day and yeah I mean I even if you know like a line from whatever you're cosplaying you know or, yeah. or, or a pose or just simple stuff it could make the difference you know and just exactly. adding that little extra touch is is so nice Memorize a line, memorize a pose. A pose is a big deal. And we don't right. talk about it enough, I feel. That like, you know, you, you put all of this work into making a certain costume. But when you go to take your picture, you take a picture like you would take any other picture. And you're not doing mm -hmm. yourself justice. Right. Memorize a pose. Practice it in front of a mirror. Get somebody to take a picture of you. You will not regret it. It right. has been a huge game changer in any cosplay that I've ever seen is practicing. Cause I, I personally have experienced this. I put a lot of work into a cosplay and I go and I take a picture and I go, why did I, why did I just pose? Like I'm posing for any family photo yeah. at, at, at like a dinner. Like yeah. what am I doing? Yeah. And I learned my lesson. Like yes. I, because just because you look like a character doesn't mean that you're getting that across. Right. Practice your poses. Right. That's something I need to do more of. Yeah. Sure. That's that's my that's my main go to for today. Practice your poses. Practice your poses. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Heroes and villains, everybody. Villains. Angles, colors, poses. Practice them. Yes. Do them, because one day we'll be out of all this. Yes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to do each other posing in cosplays one day again. And I can't wait to see it. And even if you do any closet cosplays or quarantine cosplays or whatever we're calling it these days, I want to see them. Post them. Let's get them out there. There's a ton of groups going on. Join one. You will not feel so isolated. Yep. We'll definitely connect you with some fellow costumers. Yeah, but I'm pointing at my monitor aggressively because this is the level of isolation that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but we'll get this out to you guys. Hopefully this next time, by the time you hear from us next time, we'll actually be in the same room again because we're both probably Maybe. dying of self-isolation at this point. <laughs> we're not used to it. No, it's definitely not our normal, but it's no. okay. <laughs> All right, everybody, stay safe, wash your hands, and we will see you next time. See you next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good enough. All right, bye. <laughs> bye, everybody.